Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. We're moving right along in the book of Genesis. We come today to Isaac, who, if you ask me, Isaac has a lot less prominence uh, in the story of Genesis than his dad or his son, uh, Jacob. And yet at the same time, anytime God is introduced throughout the rest of the Bible, or maybe not anytime, but oftentimes, he introduces himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the question is, why? If Isaac is merely a link in the chain, as it were, why is it that he is included with Abraham and Jacob throughout the rest of the scripture? I want to answer that question today in the context of two chapters that really show us the kind of up and down nature of Christian discipleship, which is kind of the approach that I'm taking to Genesis, is it's kind of a study in discipleship for us. So what I want to do, I want to read Genesis 21 verses 2 and 3, and then we're going to read Genesis 22, just verse 2, and then we're going to talk about both chapters. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac, which you know means he laughs, right? That's what Isaac means. In verse, in a verse 2 of the next chapter, chapter 22, then God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. First thing I want to focus on today is the joy of Isaac's birth. The joy of Isaac's birth. It is an absolute miracle of cosmic proportions that this woman, Sarah, is able to deliver a child in her 90s. Now, I was looking this up last night a little bit. I asked, I, I queried Google, Google, who is the oldest woman in recorded history to give birth to a child? And it said some woman in China or India or something uh, was 67 years old and apparently gave birth to a child. And I heard that and I said, um, okay, um, maybe, but, uh, but it seems like it's a little bit of a stretch. But, you know, shows my unbelief, I suppose. What I will say is this, Sarah is in her 90s, and she is here getting a child because God had promised her that. It's just an absolute miracle. After all these years, decades, all these attempts to assist God, all those times when the story could have gone south, God was faithful still. I don't think that I can... I don't think that I can adequately tell you how much of a miracle that this was, that Sarah was able to give birth to Isaac at her age after all of those years. And I think that that's why there's redundancy in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 21 there where it says, The Lord visited Sarah as he'd spoken. Sarah conceived, bore Abraham a son at the set time that God had spoken to him. So there's redundancy. Verse 3, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him. Whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac kind of keeps repeating the same phrases because it's almost as though Moses, who I think is writing this uh, in the inspiration of the Spirit, is saying, just in case you forgot, this was something God promised and it's something God did. Maybe you've been in conversations before and uh, there was about something where um, there was a little detail that you thought the other person was leaving out, so you gave the detail and then they didn't respond to it, so you waited until you had a time to talk again and then you repeated the detail because you didn't think that they could hear it. I've been on both ends of that, actually. And that's kind of what God is doing here. In case you forgot, I did this. I gave this child to Abraham and to Sarah. God has been faithful. This is enormously pastoral to us, isn't it? that God is faithful to his promise regardless of how long it takes. Sometimes it takes a long time. Note Sarah's words there in verse 6. It says, Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She says this because earlier on when God said to her that you're going to have a son, she laughed, and so did Abraham. And so God said, okay, you're going to laugh at my promise? You're going to name the child? He laughs so that you will always remember that you laughed at my promise that I gave you. And yet Sarah is here saying in verse 6, not that the laughter is at them, but that the laughter is with them. You know why? Because now the laughter of mockery has turned into a laughter of joy. Imagine being in this position that Sarah and Abraham are in, the utter joy. We thought we were crazy, and everybody else thought we were crazy too. And yet here, 
is our son that God had promised to us. We laughed in mockery, and now we laugh in joy. Similar, I think, to Mary in the New Testament, who was probably laughed out of the room in shame every time she told somebody, yeah, I'm still a virgin, even though she's pregnant there. And yet she had God with her, and she lives on throughout history because of her faithfulness. So Sarah lives on in history because of her faithfulness, even if she laughed when God first told her. Because to call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to remind everybody of Sarah, isn't it? And again, this is not planned to be a Mother's Day sermon, but here moms figure prominently in our, uh, in our message today. Anytime Isaac is named, you should remember Sarah, because Isaac was the baby who was given to Sarah. And here, um, you know, even though Abraham gets a lot of the Genesis narrative, and then Jacob, Isaac's son, gets a lot of the Genesis narrative. And Isaac doesn't really, the reason why he's included in that name of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is because he is an absolute miracle of God. I would argue this is just as momentous as the Exodus. That's why God repeatedly reminds everybody of Isaac's name, because this is something that should not happen. And yet it's something that God had done. Now that might be a little bit striking for me to say it's as big as the Exodus because the Exodus is the great Old Testament redemption. I just think that we've kind of under, uh, underrated what happens here with Isaac's birth. And indeed, creation is generally predictable, but when God works, he works in ways that we really can't explain other than the God who created all things must have worked. There's no other explanation for this. I'm going to skip over the uh, Ishmael and Hagar story. Uh, The reason I'm going to stick over that is because it's a gut-wrenching story, and I can only handle one gut-wrenching story per message because we're going to get to one here in just a second. Uh, I just will say that at the end of chapter 22 and verse, excuse me, at the end of chapter 21 and verse 22, when Abraham sees Abimelech again, I just want to remind you of what Abimelech says to Abraham. Verse 22, he says, God is with you, Abraham, in all that you do. The reason I want to bring that up is because if Abraham doesn't know this by now, that God is with him, he probably never never will learn it, will he? Because God has just shown repeatedly that he is with him. So the second thing, the first thing that we saw was the joy of Isaac's birth. The second thing that I want you to see is the surprising strength of Isaac's faith. The surprising strength of Isaac's faith. In a similar way to later on in the biblical narrative when Jesus is baptized, And it's a big time pinnacle because the spirit of God comes and the father says, this is my son. And then immediately what happens? He's taken right into testing in the wilderness. So there's a high and then there's a low. And also similarly to one of my favorite stories in all of scripture, because I identify with it so much, not the first part of the story, but the second part of the story, when Elijah, he defeats the Baal worshipers and he, uh, he should be on a high the rest of his life because God has clearly been with him. But you remember what happens? Jezebel, the queen, sends him a message saying, because of what you've done, I'm coming after you and I'm going to kill you. And what does Elijah do? He runs off in fear and he becomes borderline suicidal. This is in 1 Kings 18 and 19. Just like in both of those stories where there's a high and then there's a low, so here, Genesis 21 goes from a high of Isaac's birth where God has been faithful to a low, that is to say, where Abraham is going to go through the greatest test imaginable, from blessings to pain and trauma. Abraham is, to be be specific, he's called by God to offer his own son, Isaac, as a sacrifice on an altar, as we saw there in verse 2. Or, as Bob Dylan summarized famously 60 years ago, God God said to Abraham, "Kill kill me your son, Sorry, I'm like confused here because I want to say it in Bob Dylan's voice, but I'm at the pulpit, so I'm not going to do it. God said to Abraham, kill me your son. Abe said to God, you must be putting me on. Maybe you remember that song. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, But that's essentially what happens here. He says, put Isaac on the altar and offer him as a sacrifice. (laughs) What what was Abraham feeling when God said this? But verse 1 of chapter 22 shows us that God is testing Abraham. So God knows what he's going to do every step of the way. And then verse 2 highlights that Isaac is Abraham's beloved son. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him on the altar. Hmm. 
We spent time looking at this several months ago. I think it was around Christmas time, so I'm not going to labor every detail. I just want you to think, can you imagine going through this? Can you imagine God coming to you and saying this to you? I really can't. I'm thankful that God doesn't do this. It seems like this is a one-off kind of situation right here. Um, I just can't imagine what was going through Abraham's mind. If you look in verse 3, the details are given to Abraham's preparation. He rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose. A lot of details included in that verse that are usually not included in Genesis narrative, but it seems to be the case that it's showing that Abraham has his face set towards doing what God wants him to do, regardless of how he feels about it. So it shows his details. Verse 4, the focus is on the fact that this went on for days. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar off. He's journeying with Isaac and these two men for days. Can you imagine what was going on in his mind for all of those days on this journey? One commentator speculated that you can imagine Abraham carrying his son in his arms. We don't know how old the son is. Maybe he's a little boy or something. And as he's sleeping, Abraham looks down at him, and then he has to look away because, he wants, because he's about to start crying at what he's about to do. I don't know. I will just point out that in verse 5 and then again in verse 8, we find evidence that Abraham knows, like I told you a few months ago, that something is up. Verse 5, he says to the young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I love the New King James, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Look again in verse 8. Abraham said, after Isaac asks him where the lamb is for the offering, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. I think that in any event, Verse 1 says this is a test and that the promise had been repeated so many times to Abraham that God was going to bless him through his son Isaac that Abraham knew somehow or another Isaac and I are coming back down that mountain together. I don't know how God's going to do it, but I believe that God is going to do it. That being said, Isaac's part in this narrative is so often passed over, isn't it? We don't talk about what's going on in Isaac's mind throughout this entire thing. What was he thinking? God doesn't really tell us, does he? We don't find what Isaac was thinking. Only the implication that paralleled to Abraham's incredible obedience was Isaac's incredible obedience, even if it means death on the altar. Because look in verse 9. They came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. This means that Isaac went along with it. We don't find any fighting. We don't find any arguing here. He went along with it. And I might be speculating here, but I think it's reasonable, isn't it? He went along with it, especially considering the fact that in Hebrews 11, Isaac's faith is highlighted as being just as faithful as all those other giants throughout the Old Testament. His name also in, being included in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thing, it's, it's because not only was he God's miracle to Abraham and Sarah, but also because he trusted the Lord in the midst of incredible uncertainty. It's not that Isaac didn't have any unbelief. I think I told you this a couple weeks ago. In Romans 4, when Paul says that no unbelief made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, that means that he had unbelief, he just didn't listen to it. So I think we could also speculate here that Isaac, he might have had unbelief as well, but he just was obedient and he trusted the Lord, kept walking and God was faithful. And by the way, that's all that God requires of you. He's not calling on you to, to live a life where you never have any doubts or never have any questions or never have any unbelief. And that's good because I've got a lot of questions myself. But he says, I just don't want you to let those control you. Take a step. Just like we were talking about in Sunday school this morning when Peter steps out of the boat, you have to think that he's got a little bit of unbelief. He's never walked on water before. And yet he says, if the Lord calls me, I can step out and I can walk. And he has that unbelieving spasm, which is my favorite way of referring to it, um, that causes him to start sinking. But he knew that if he called out to the Lord, the Lord would save him. 
That's what God requires of us. He doesn't require us to have all of our questions answered or to have everything perfectly figured out or to be a walking systematic theology in our mind where we have an answer to everything. He calls on us to follow him and to trust him, to listen to him and to say, okay, God, I don't understand, but fine, we'll go there. And that's what Abraham knew, and that's what Isaac knew. And here's how God answered in the last minute there in verses 10 to 11, when Abraham stretches out his hand, takes the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and you know the rest. Stops him. He doesn't have to offer his son. Oftentimes, this is what God does, isn't it? He will wait until the very last minute because he's testing your faith to see if you will follow him, to see if you will trust him. My favorite example of this is in the Exodus when the Israelites walk up to the Red Sea. You hear me bring it up all the time. Moses makes them walk. No, it's not Moses. Rewind. It's God who makes them walk all the way up to the water before Moses puts his staff in the water and it goes up and there's a walkway in the middle of it. Can you imagine what was going through the Israelites' minds? Uh, Moses, we're running out of land here. We've got a lot of kids that don't know how to swim. We've been living in the Egyptian desert for all these years. We don't know how to swim because we've never seen water before. I'm kidding. Obviously, they'd seen water before, but God makes them go all the way up to the sea because he's testing their faith and showing them that he comes up right at the last, right at the right moment. Same thing here as well. We should see this rhythm of God making us go all the way to the end so that we will see that he's even there too. Okay. So, we've seen some ups and downs uh, with, with Isaac. We've seen an up, he's born, a down, he's offered on, he's, he's you know, willing to offer himself on the altar, and then an up again because God commends Abraham's faith and reiterates the promise. Now, regarding these ups and downs, I want to just uh, focus our attention here um, for the remainder of our time on three points um, relating to the ups and downs. The first one is this, following the Lord has much joy and much anxiety. Both joy and anxiety. The reason I'm talking about this is because I know for a fact that there are so many of us who have significant anxiety struggles. I just was reading a book uh, over the last year by Scott Stossel. Maybe you've heard his name before. He was an American. Uh, uh, um, he might have been an editor for the I don't know what one of these one of these uh, one of these uh, news outlets something like that. Anyway, he was giving a uh, a history of anxiety throughout world history. I was blown away how this has just been such a crippling thing for humanity, probably for as long as humanity has been around, and it's still prominent with us as well. Many of us struggle with it. Much joy and much anxiety. It's not one or the other. It's not either all joy or all suffering, but it's both, isn't it? Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He also says, take heart. I've overcome the world. So I'm with you if you're poor in spirit, you're in a good place. Take heart. I've overcome the world. He says, blessed are those who mourn. He also says, rejoice uh, for your names are written in heaven. Paul says we must suffer with Jesus. It's like, that's not what I signed up for. Oh, yes, it is. If you became a Christian, you're going to suffer with Jesus. But he also says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say what? Rejoice. Paul, well, which one is it? Am I going to have to suffer or am I going to have to rejoice? Both. It's part of the Christian life. Say, doesn't God want me to be happy? Doesn't he want me to have joy? Of course he does. Of course that's what he's after for you. And you will be happy and you will have joy in glory one day. But until then, Living in a good world gone bad, which is what this world is, it's a good world gone bad, we cannot expect perfection, can we? We ought to expect ups and downs as we journey by faith. C.S. Lewis uh, in the screw tape letters, and um, you know, I, I often make up words in the pulpit. This will sound like a made up word. If it is, I didn't make it up. Lewis talks in screw tape letters about undulation. And undulation is this we go high in our Christian life. And then we go low in our Christian life. And we're going up and down all the time in our lives so that we are not too comfortable in one place or another. 
And that's how God keeps us from getting stagnant, either too high or too low. If we're too high, we're too comfortable in the world, and we're not going to love the Lord. If we're too low, we're not going to hope in Christ. We're not going to have hope. And so what does he do? He gives us both highs and lows. Some of us are more prone to lows. Some of us are more prone to highs. But at least he gives us both to keep us moving forward. And thus, we're not at home in this life, but we also know we're right where the Lord has us. He's shepherding us whether we're in the slew of despond or we're, or we're having a sight of the celestial city. We know that he's got us. There's both Genesis 21 and Genesis 22. So the following the Lord has much joy and much anxiety, just like Abraham knew and just like Isaac knew here from an early day. Secondly, expect anxiety to follow joy. Great times of joy, great highs, Expect that there's going to be an evening out that's coming later. And I don't want to be like Johnny Raincloud here if you're going through a high time. But if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you know, you know that there's going to come a time where I'm going to have to go low again. It's in the lows, Lewis rightly said, that God teaches us to walk. Think about it like this. He puts his hands on our legs and he says, here is how you walk. And that's what the high points are in life. But then the low points are when he takes his hands away and says, you know how to do this. You can do this. You just need to walk. In a similar way that, uh, that my three-year-old Dorothy May is uh, riding her bike all the time outside now. It's got training wheels on it, and we are going to come to a point eventually where she's going to have to learn how to balance on that thing without the training wheels, right? And it's not just going to be something where I'm going to be able to say, you can ride the training wheels fine. You're going to be perfect the first time that you try to ride your bike without the training wheels. You know what's going to be required. I'm going to have to take those training wheels off, and she's going to have to kind of learn to balance herself. How is she going to learn unless she, unless she tries? In a similar way, uh, if that's the case, the Lord takes us into high times with training wheels. And then he says, you learned what it was like to go. Now I'm going to take the wheels off, and you're going to learn how to balance as well trusting me. That's what the low points are. Oftentimes, just like what follows the joy of Genesis 21, there will be a puzzling time of trial, like in Genesis 22, with Abraham offering Isaac on the altar. It, it is puzzling, isn't it? Why does God need to know Abraham's faith? Doesn't he already know it? I'm thinking about like later in the Gospels when Jesus is about to feed the 5,000. And he asks Philip, one of his disciples, he says, how are we going to feed all these people? But John tells us Jesus said this to test Philip because he knew what he was going to do. Doesn't God already know? Why does he need to test Abraham's faith? Let me just be frank here with you. Let me just give you, let me just give you the most scholarly, um, academic, smart thing that I can tell you. Why did God test Abraham like this? I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't tell us because he already knows his faith. He already knew what he was going to do. And it is modernistic, a product of the modern mind, to say, I have to understand everything if I'm going to believe and follow the Lord. Isn't it the exact opposite of Proverbs 3 where it says, lean not on your what? Own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord and he will make your path straight. Boy, we don't do that well because we're so smart today. Kind of, in some ways. We know a lot of things. I wonder how much of, uh, of what we know is actually important. Say, I have to know the future. I have to know what God's going to do. No. Faith says, I believe that God knows what's best for me. And if, I don't, if I'm struggling to believe that now, he's going to show it to me. He's going to reveal it to me, and he's going to prove himself to me again. Think about it like this. Regardless of how painful this trial was, can you imagine how Abraham's faith grew through this? He might have come out of there saying, boy, Lord, that was pretty rough. But he also came out of it saying, I went to the absolute breaking point of my life, and God met me there. If he met me there, isn't he going to meet me here and here and here every other step of the way? Think about how his faith, we might not understand God's methods, but we can see the effect of it. 
Abraham clearly had to grow. And by the way, Mudi and I were just talking about this the other day. Um, it's not a test of your faith if you're not struggling with your faith. Think about, that's what James says in James 1, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. If you're not struggling with your faith, it's not a test of your faith. And so what that means is that if you really want to grow in grace, if you really want to grow as a Christian, you're also going to be growing in the intensity of the trial that God is going to have to hit you with sometimes. And so rejoice if things are really rough. Rejoice if you feel like the enemy is after you and you're wondering if you're even a Christian. Rejoice. It means that the Lord is testing you because he wants to grow you even more. Say, oh great, that means even more intense trial later on. Yeah, but this is going to result in glory one day. and You're going to be so glad that the Lord did all this. And you know that this is the truth. So expect the anxiety to follow the joy. Third thing I want to say here. Expect joy, therefore, to follow the anxiety as well. There's much trial, there's much difficulty, but there is always an afterward. Think about uh, in Hebrews 12, that great passage on God's fatherly discipline of us and how it's painful, but it says also in that chapter, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. There's always an afterward, isn't there? God always has a purpose, and it always comes to an end in time. We've grown, we're intact, we're thankful. We say, I don't know his methods, but I know that he does, and I know that I've grown. Again, the end of chapter 22 there, God repeats the promise. He commends Abraham. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Spurgeon was fond of pointing out um, how it's often the case that joy follows anxiety, and then that leads to Eventually, there's going to be more anxiety, but then joy is going to come later on as well. It's just this kind of up and down thing. And the result is always growth in grace. Affirmation of the promise. In this case, all through the testing of this one child whose birth was a miracle, who then had two sons, and one of those sons had 12 sons. And there's Israel right there, right? All because of what God had been doing through this man, Abraham, and his son Isaac. I could draw a lot of parallels here between, between Isaac and Jesus, couldn't I? Um, he's offered, it says, on a hill um, in the land of Moriah. By the way, that's right outside of Jerusalem eventually. Eventually it's going to be uh, the area where Jerusalem is. So there's one parallel. Isaac is um, Abraham's only son, his beloved son. He's willing to die, trusting God. He's submissive to his father's will. And his human existence is a miracle of divine working. I could apply all of that to Jesus, couldn't I? As the son of God, it's a miracle that he was, that he was born as a human. He's God's only son. He's God's beloved son. He's submissive to his father's will, even if it means to the point of death on an altar. And so Jesus is so easy to see here. At least it seems like he should be easy to see here. We should see this as a preaching of the work of the cross eventually. But I would also say this. He not only parallels Jesus, but he also parallels you as a Christian. And here's how, two ways, quickly. If you belong to Jesus, it is because of God's doing just like Isaac's birth was the result of God's doing. What did Jesus say in John 6? He said, all who come to me, they come to me because the Father's given them to me. If you're born again, it's because God has given you new life from above, just like he gave Isaac life from above. This is exactly why Paul can say in Galatians 4.28, and I'm quoting it exactly, like Isaac, you are children of the promise. Basically, you're just like Isaac. The spiritual life that's inside of you by the Spirit of God, whereby you are trusting in Christ, you know the truth, you're going to make it to glory. It's a difficult life, it's a difficult journey, but you know the end even now, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is all a miracle of God's working, just like Isaac was. Don't 
think that he will forsake the work of his hands. Just like the end of Psalm 138, David says, do not forsake the work of your hands. God's response is, I won't. If I've loved you till now, I'm going to love you every step of the way. Follow me and stick with me, and I will keep you, and I will protect you. Not only does, do, you, does, uh, do you parallel Isaac, I should say, um, in that, but you parallel Isaac this way as well. You endure incredible trial and incredible testing, but you come out clean on the other side every time. You know this. You've been through those dark nights of the soul. You've been through those dark times. You don't know how you did it, but somehow or another you did it. God kept you and God protected you and God brought you through it. Or maybe to put it another way, again, like I quoted last week from Psalm 34, 19 and 20, two verses that are worth memorizing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them will be lost. That is to say, it's going to be a lot of trial, a lot of difficulty, a lot of low times but the Lord is going to bring you back up out of every single one of them, and you're going to be intact. You're not going to lose anything of yourself. Actually, you're going to gain yourself more and more. One more thing I want to say about this quickly uh, as I'm closing, and it's, uh, it's from Matthew 22. You don't have to turn there, but you remember Jesus when he's confronted by a group of uh, theologians and scholars who don't believe in the resurrection, and they're very... They're very wise in how they approach him, although apparently they're not, they're not that wise because they try to outsmart Jesus, and um, so maybe they're not as smart as they seem. But they come to him, and they try to trick him into, uh, into teaching about the resurrection that's going to be illogical or something like that. And Jesus responds by quoting what God says to Moses at the burning bush. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus says, this is proof of the resurrection. Now I sit back when I read that passage in my little chair in my office. If you've seen my chair in my office, you know it's not a little chair. Um, And I sit back and I just say, how is that proof of the resurrection? How is that proof of new life? And my immediate thought is to say that Jesus is saying, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive with God in heaven, and that proves the resurrection. That very well might be what Jesus is saying. In light of the broader context of Genesis, I wonder if there's something more to it than that. Not to the exclusion of that point, but maybe there's something more to it. You remember what God said to Adam and Eve. In the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will what? You'll die. He says you'll die. But, but when somebody comes to follow God after that, after they're cast out of Eden, when they come to follow God, is it not the case that in one sense they've come back to life? Um, I, I think that this point is made in uh, the parable of the prodigal son. When the son goes off and squanders all of his inheritance, when he comes back, what does the father say? My son was dead and now he's alive again. It's like he wasn't dead. He was living and he was off squandering all the inheritance. Ah, but he was actually dead because he wasn't, he wasn't at home where he should be. In a similar way, it seems to me like perhaps Jesus' point is not a point about heaven. It might actually be a point about the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Following God, walking with him, trusting themselves to him. Because that's true life. That's eternal life. That's something that never ends. It only gets better and better. Because using this life to further God's kingdom is truly eternal life. Again, chapter 22, where Abraham offers Isaac on the altar, or at least begins to, that would feel like death to Abraham, and it almost was death to Isaac. But there is nothing more alive and true than trusting God even to the point of lifting the knife. Because you know that God is going to come through somehow or another, and you know that whatever he is doing, it is some kind of effective surgery that he is performing on me. And it's going to have the effect that he wants it to have. That 
not floating around in the clouds playing a harp with a disembodied soul. That, walking with God and saying, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know he's going to. That's eternal life. That's what Jesus came to call us to, and that's what it means to walk with God. I hope that you know this. I hope that you understand, like I said, I think it was last week, this journey with the Lord is not a sprint. It is a walk. It's not, it's not a journey where you have every question answered. It's one where you listen to the voice of God, you follow him, and you just say, Lord, you know. I don't, but you do. And I know that you're going to carry me and lead me and shepherd me and feed me every step of the way. That's what it means to have eternal life. Let's pray. So our Father and our God, we thank you uh, that you have given us these true life pictures of what it was like to journey with the Lord even before he came into the world um, in the person of Jesus Christ. And we're on the other side of that, and yet we're waiting on Jesus' second coming. And we're also living by the Spirit, just like they were living by faith in the promises of God, which, which really the promises are the presence of the Spirit. We are in a more powerful and, and it, in an even more effective way, walking in and keeping in step with the Spirit who is the presence of Jesus with us. And we don't see the future. We hardly understand the present, let's be honest. But you know. And we think about this, this young man, this little boy, Isaac born as a miracle, and then full of faith, trusting God, trusting his father. And you came through at the last minute, as you always do. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would also trust the Lord to be out for our very, very best. The cross proves to us that nothing else could be the case. And so I pray that if there's anybody here who, who hasn't come to Christ yet, move in their heart, Lord. Help them to taste and see that God is good and help them to see that God wants them. Um, and I pray, O oh Lord, that we would each and every one of us walk this journey of faith just one step at a time, trusting the Lord in the highs and the lows, because you're faithful in all of them. We pray this in Christ's name.